Okay, a, a great way to end the conversation on, uh, or to wrap up the conversation on scheduling and um, uh, resource allocations is, is to look at Goldratt's critical chain. And, you know, this section of the textbook does, a, I think, a, a really good job of trying to paint some of the human complexities associated with coming up with very reasonable and good estimates and then being able to follow through on them so that projects can actually com be, you know, be completed on time. So Goldratt is a researcher and he did, used the theory of constraints and he applied them to uh, the constrained resource uh, scheduling problem. But he makes a, a whole bunch of, um, I, I guess, observations that pertain to the human behaviors associated with both scheduling and resource allocations. And, and so I think in some ways it's bigger than just this resource scheduling problem. And so, like I say, I think it's a great way to, to wrap up this little bit of conversation. And so let's do that. So Roldrat talks about strong optimism bias, which is to say that we uh, underestimate the amount of time it's going to take to do the project. And he points to a whole bunch of contributors, uh, seven to be exact, uh, as adding to that strong optimism bias. And, and I think it is actually worth taking the time to look at each of these individually and seeing how they're going to play and, and perhaps what you might be able to do to counter it or at least acknowledge it and be aware of it when you're doing your scheduling. So the first one he calls thoughtless optimism. And basically, this is, this is the, the project manager who attributes all late finishes to bad luck. And while, you know, luck, perhaps uh, another word for, for uh, probability, uh, might be true, it, it tends to defy the benefits of quality risk uh, assessment. And so thoughtless optimism is almost to say that somebody is not applying risk management uh, as it pertains to their schedule in a reasoned way. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think there's something to be said for that. We, we tend to come up with an estimate and say, okay, let's hit the estimate uh, without, you know, appreciation for the stochastic nature of that and that there's a 50% chance uh, of being done early, but there's a 50% chance uh, of being done late. So uh, anyway, uh, thoughtless optimism, the first of seven uh, contributors to the optimism bias. Um, so the second one then, uh, that capacity should be equal to demand. And this really starts to speak to that just-in-time delivery and everything else. Uh, if you'll think of... Uh, manufacturing line operations and everything else where it is tuned to the second to the minute uh, with the resources arriving just in time to be used. And so where functional managers bring that approach to project management, it, it defies the probabilities and the changing nature of projects. And so that leads to issues, right? We don't have what we need in order to be able to uh, execute the project uh, or execute each task as they come up. And, and this leads to that recommendation that we don't uh, schedule our critical resources beyond 85 to, to 90%. So the other issue that uh, he identifies uh, adding to this optimism is that, you know, there is the, the student syndrome. Of course, what the student syndrome is, is that you don't actually start your assignment uh, until just before it's due. So you kind of put it off and procrastinate it until just before it's due. And, you know, I, I typically liken that kind of behavior as the immature student versus the mature student who comes in and brings a work ethic uh, from the professional world to it. And so you get an assignment, you start it right away. Uh, so, yeah, if people are putting off the work until it absolutely has to be done, then you're giving away all of your flexibility. And in giving away your flexibility, you're further constraining your, your project and not giving yourself the opportunity to respond to issues. Uh, you know, so once the issue arrives, you, you have no more flexibility with, with which to manage it without affecting your critical path. 
So multitasking uh, to re reduce alter uh, idle time. So intermixing tasks and projects kind of, um, it, it ignores the inefficiencies associated with startup uh, and moving between tasks. Uh, so we, we certainly know from the psychology perspective that multitasking doesn't really work. I mean, because you're actually not sharing your, your attention, you're, you're just moving it back and forth very quickly between tasks. And, and so if you think of there, there's a lag every time you move your attention between tasks or, or between uh, activities, then you can appreciate what the efficiency inefficiency is. And uh, there's a really good example in, in the textbook uh, associated with how scheduling uh, the task sequential or, or you know sharing your attention on the tasks or the projects simply puts off the completion of one project even though it doesn't contribute to completing the second project earlier. And, and so that's to give up benefit for no uh, appreciable gain. Uh, so, so absolutely, M uh, multitasking, I think, is a, a challenging issue that you have to look at. Uh, and so if you overburden people with a bunch of projects, they have a tendency to try to, to move all of the projects along, in which case none of them really move along effectively. So the, the next one that he identifies is one about complexity. And the assumption then is, is that if you have a project time the same, between two projects, although one of those projects is highly complex and the other project is fairly simple, straightforward scheduling, that they're equivalent. And I, I bring your attention back to the conversation we had about merge bias and how the probabilities of the parallel paths ultimately lead to the reduction in uh, the probability of completing on time the, the final milestone. And, and so complexity in, in its absolute mathematical nature adds to or, or reduces the probability that a project is going to be completed on time. So complexity is uh, something that has to be uh, managed and uh, certainly add to your awareness of what the challenges or the risks are to your project. So the, the, the next one uh, says, you know, management, uh, uh, having the sense that in order to motivate the workers, they have to put them under the pressure of risking failure and overburden them. Otherwise, they're not going to feel the pressure to get everything done. And so they're not going to work very hard. And, and the, the reality is, is we know from the social sciences, is that there is kind of a, an optimum uh, slight risk of failure that gets the best performance. And so to overburden that is to reduce performance. And uh, so, yeah, we have, we have to work against some of these simple perceptions of how to motivate our, our workers and uh, I mean, projects have enough stress associated with them. Uh, we don't normally have to manufacture it in order to get good performance uh, out of our people. Um, and the last one he identifies has to do uh, with game playing. And this, of course, is where, you know, the junior supervisors and the managers and the executives are all anticipating each other's uh, shell game. So, you know, the supervisor is going to pad his time estimate, therefore be, and he's going to pad the time estimate because management is going to cut the time estimate, and therefore he has to pad the estimate. And of course, in the absence of real honest to God, good quality communication and trust, uh, it, we're just going to drive down into a vicious circle. So, so these are Goldratt's critical chain Contrib contributors to strong optimism. I, I think there's something in each of them to be considered and to be aware of. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I don't know that uh, that they all exist uh, in every project or, or anything else. I, I think good leadership and good management style uh, can manage some of these. Uh, certainly, there needs to be a, a trust between the various levels working in the project in order to be able to. Uh, come up with a realistic estimate and then uh, expect to come close to achieving that estimate. So we, we've talked about a, a particular activity having a 50% chance 
uh, of finishing early and a 50% chance of finishing late. And, and so we know that it is a mathematical equality, the likelihood that it will finish early or finish late. And, and so one would ask oneself, okay, so, so that would imply that across the length of the project, those tasks that finish early will balance off those that finish late. And, you know, do they cancel each other out? And the reality is, is that they don't cancel each other out. They, they, they can mitigate against each other, but they don't cancel each other out. And so the question becomes why? There's a couple of reasons why that is true. First off, when, when somebody finishes early, they're very reluctant to report the fact that they finish early. Um, I kind of equate this to people really working hard not to finish under budget uh, because the thought is, is that the time estimate will be cut the next time or the budget will be cut the next time and, and uh, there will be blame uh, and games played over that estimate. And the reality is 50% chance that it should be finished early. And, and so there is a very a big reluctance to report that finish uh, and to actually slow down work to consume the time that has been allocated for the project. And so in this way, some of that time, that probability of finishing early starts to go away. The other one is that resources lined up for the next activity may or may not be available for the next activity to start right away if it finishes early. In your schedule, you're planning your resources, you're planning your labor, you're planning everything to be available to start the next task at the right time. and if a project, if, if, if things move left and start to finish early, they, the resources, the, the labor may not be available to start early. Uh, and particularly if there's not very much warning or notice that the site is going to be available for their effort uh, on time. And, and so th there, there tends to be uh, a loss of productivity or a void when things finish early, as we wait for the next project or the next task to start. Whereas when something is going late, there tends to be uh, people standing around and waiting. Now, we, we had talked earlier about sort of the just-in-time delivery. And one of the th reasons why things might not be ready to start early is if the, you're practicing just-in-time delivery, you haven't brought your resources in in a time to allow ourselves to take advantage of a, 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 an early finish. And so just put that into the context. Uh, there are things you can do to try to be ready, to try to use that time effectively, uh, but it is a challenge. It doesn't matter really how you look at it. So then uh, Goldratt went on to look at the common chain of events. Uh, th this is kind of just building on what we've already looked at, those seven uh, things, uh, and, and it gives a little bit more flush to it. And uh, I, I think I, I leave you to, uh, to read this over, uh, to look at it. Uh, again, uh, I think it is a really good sort of summary challenge of some of the human nature issues uh, associated with, uh, up until now, what has been a schedule produced on, on a piece of computer paper. Um, so th the last thing that uh, we wanted to mention from his work was the critical chain. And this is where he, he really does look at resources, exclusively resources. And he notes that the project manager often ignores dependencies between resources and tasks. Keep in mind that when we built the critical path method, all of those uh, dependencies were causal, you know, physical relationships that led one to the other. And, and then we over laid our resource calendars to shuffle uh, our activities uh, in order to accommodate our resources. But what it didn't quite do is it didn't align them up to show tasks that are showing as independent, but are actually dependent because of the way the resources um, need to be shared or move from one task to the other. So if two tasks that are supposed to run in parallel are separated and done sequentially because the same resources are needed for the both, they actually now become dependent one on the other, although our Gantt chart isn't showing a dependence uh, one between the next. And so uh, Goldratt looked at this and he, he came up with another concept where he basically says that we should reorder 
all of our paths through the project based on resource dependencies and, and uh, technological uh, precedence requirements. And then the longest of those paths would be our, our critical chain. And, uh, you know, th there's something to be said there. Certainly an awareness of those dependencies uh, needs to be sustained and maintained, uh, despite the fact that they're not showing up deliberately on our, uh, uh, our Gantt chart. And so that's really kind of the wrap up of the sort of the scheduling and the resources. The, uh, I think it helps to remind us of how integrated they are. Uh, every method we have for displaying the information uh, misses something. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it's, you know, it's up to us to, to dig into them and to try to uh, anticipate the, the issues, to remember those dependencies that aren't, aren't identified, and to respond to them. Uh, so, uh, yeah, lots to think about. Uh, I think scheduling and resource allocations, uh, it, it's uh, probably one of the more uh, interesting uh, logic problems that you'll, you'll ever have to do. And so uh, hopefully you enjoyed the, the last couple topics and you're ready to go on. Uh, because with this, we're actually going to execute our project. And so we're going to have to talk a little bit about, you know, monitoring, controlling, change management, that type of thing. So uh, we, we have one more video to put out that's on uh, project crashing. And uh, so I hope you enjoy that too.